Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing good. The weekend has begun. It's Saturday. But that doesn't mean that we will take a break from analyzing the Hindu newspaper. So we are back again at 10 a.m. to discuss some of the most important news stories from the mains and from the prelims point of view as we do every single day. I hope all of you have also been attending the quiz that follows this discussion. The quiz that is the objective type quiz that takes place on our telegram channel. Please make sure you attend that quiz as well just to ensure that you revise every concept that we discuss here. I also hope that by now all of you have subscribed to our YouTube channel to get notification about all the other types of initiatives that we take up. Without waiting any further, let's see what are the important topics that we have here for you today. And as I said earlier as well, I'm very glad, especially for those who make it a habit to join in right on time at 10 a.m. so that you don't miss even the beginning of it. These are the important topics we have taken up. Three from the mains point of view, while three are the topics from the prelims examination point of view. We were starting our discussion with India's semiconductor mission. Now, as you know, ever since the COVID-19 pandemic hit, there has been a lot of talk about the global supply chain in semiconductor chips. You would have seen there is a shortage of semiconductor chips all across the world. And every country is focusing on building their own semiconductor industry, including India. This is what the article is about. What does India have to do in order to give a push to semiconductor in India? Then we will be talking about economic recovery. This is an article on Sri Lanka, actually not India. The title doesn't say the word Sri Lanka. The title only says long and rocky road to economic recovery. This is with reference to Sri Lanka. What is happening in Sri Lanka? What are the reasons behind the economic trouble? This is what we'll be discussing. Then the government of India just released a new foreign trade policy. Thus, yesterday, the government of India released a new policy document under which the government of India is seeking to give a further push to India's exports. Whenever these kind of policies come in, they are extremely important for the mains examination point of view. So we'll be discussing what are the main pointers of foreign trade policy that has been introduced. What is it that the government is trying to achieve? Then we'll go ahead from prelims point of view. We also have new stories. For example, cert in the government's premier organization to fight against any cyber attacks in India, that is cert in, that may become an exempted organization under RTI. As you know, under the right to information, there are certain organizations that are exempted, meaning that there are certain organizations that can deny giving information, cert in may become a part of it. Then we'll be discussing about Australia seeking to diversify their lithium export. Lithium has been in the news for various reasons, including the discovery of lithium in Jammu and Kashmir. Australia also exports a lot of lithium. Australian Minister for Trade has made a statement that they would like to sell lithium to other countries, including India as well. And in the end, UK has decided to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Treaty, the TPP, the treaty from where Donald Trump brought America out. UK is now deciding to join that. So we'll be discussing that as well. These are all the topics that we have lined up here for you. So let's begin with the first article. Now the first article as we discuss is about India's semiconductor mission. Now I'm sure all of you would have seen when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, a lot of industries around the world were actually in a slowdown mode for a lot of various reasons be it the tourism industry, be it the aviation industry, be it industry related to people going out and working. Only those industries were able to sustain, which could provide work from home opportunities. Manufacturing also take, took a major hit. Amongst all the industries around the world that took a hit, semiconductor industry or the chips industry as you call it, was one of the worst hit industries. The global supply chain was hit. Most of these chips are made in countries such as Taiwan, China. Now, I'm sure Xi Jinping would not like me when I say Taiwan is a country, but let's assume Taiwan is a country for now. Taiwan, China, South Korea, these are the countries that mainly are into manufacturing of semiconductor chips. As the entire world is moving towards more and more technology, we know the fact that the number of chips required to make even the smallest of instruments is actually increasing. Every single thing, be it your AC, even not just AC, AC remote, television, television remote, your car, your mobile, all of these are filled with semiconductor chips. So semiconductor chips have now become an essential part of our life. Do you know 
in 2020 or in 2021, 2022 also, if you went to buy a car in India, almost every car had a waiting period of six months, seven months. In some cases, cars had a waiting period of one year also. The reason being that there was a shortage of supply of semiconductor chips and the global supply chain was not as robust as we had wanted. This was a lesson that many countries realized. That is why after pandemic, many countries decided to give a push to semiconductor manufacturing in their own country, including India. So government of India started something called India's Semiconductor Mission. Now the problem is on paper, it is easy to say we will set up a semiconductor industry, we will set up a factory, but in reality, it is not that easy. Setting up a semiconductor industry requires huge amount of capital. So it requires huge capital. But just capital is not the only thing that will ensure that this industry runs. Apart from that, you also require expertise. Now, Government of India did announce the semiconductor mission. Government of India said we are giving it a budget of 76,000 crore rupees. But this is not enough money as per the experts. You require a lot more money. Now, why is this article written? This article is written because recently, just a few weeks back, there was an agreement signed between India and the US. The agreement was that the two countries will not make any laws, will not give any subsidies to their companies that will harm the semiconductor plans of India. That is the entire idea. The idea is that US and India will ensure that India's semiconductor plans are not harmed by the subsidies that the countries are given to their own organizations. Now, the idea here is that India really wants investment and expertise from one company. Now, which is that one company? Whenever we talk about chips, computer chips, semiconductor chips, which is the first company that comes to your mind? What do you think? You all use your computers. Which is the first company that comes to your mind? What do you think? The answer is Intel. Ever since we have started using the laptops, etc. The first company that usually comes to our mind is Intel, semiconductor chips, Intel. Intel is the company that is behind the invention of these semiconductor chips. So government of India has been in talks with Intel for a long time for their investment and their expertise. We want Intel to partner with the Indian government and with the Indian private organizations to set up their plans in India. But Intel is not really interested. For Intel, they know that the demand for semiconductor chips is so high all around the world that they can set up plants anywhere. They are right now focusing on US. They are not really giving a lot of attention to India. And this is where India now needs to have a rethink on our policy. Now, does it mean we do not have any of these kind of factories? That is not true. India did set up such a factory in 1983 in Mohali. That factory was set up by government of India. It was called Semiconductor Laboratory. SCL. The idea was back in 1980s that once this company becomes big enough, we will be able to ensure that we have enough semiconductor chips for our country and we'll be able to export as well. However, as I said, these semiconductor factories require constant expenditure, require constant investment. And that is why this factory also did not become very big. This factory had certain troubles. For example, this factory had a major fire in 1989. Then after the 1991 reforms, most of the Indian companies started importing these chips rather than taking it from this company. So even today, this company does exist, but it has not really made any groundbreaking invention. So you can say we are not starting from zero. India does have a semiconductor factory in Mohali. But again, this is not something that is actually making a lot of groundbreaking discovery. Now, in this aspect, number one, Intel not showing a lot of interest. And number two, this semiconductor industry, semiconductor factory that we have not being able to produce the kind of technology that we require. As per the author, what are the way forwards? What is it that we can do from now onwards? Now, please remember this. When you talk about semiconductor chips, semiconductor chips are not all the same. Semiconductor chips are of different sizes, mainly different thickness. I'll give you an example. See, 
earlier remember when our parent when we used to be small the television that used to be at our home the television was this thick right the crt monitor if you look at the television from side on these used to be these thick television right the crt monitors as we used to call them now crt monitors are not really seen anywhere it is very rare that you will see a crt monitor now if you look at any machine any uh, tv etc led tv lcd tv all of these are this thick so the thickness had has reduced considerably how is that possible the reason why thickness has reduced considerably is the thickness of semiconductor chips thickness of all the components inside the tv has reduced this is why we are able to ensure that now we can have television in such a compact size for example if you google and see the images of first ever computer do you know the first ever computer that was actually built occupied an entire room it was like a wardrobe in the entire room there was one single computer very very slow and now the mobile phone that you keep in your pocket is or much powerful than the first computer ever built which occupied the entire room the reason why the size is being reduced every single year every few years the size is being or made smaller because of the semiconductor chips becoming more compact becoming smaller now this is where semiconductor chips play an important role as per the author the government of india right now rather than focusing on very advanced semiconductor chips for which we require expertise of intel etc rather than that the government should focus on other semiconductor chips which are not very small for example the author says we should focus on segment which is over 180 nanometers this segment that is over 180 nanometer this does not require that much expertise and we would be able to make that so as per the author let's focus not on very cutting edge technology for which you require help from intel and a lot of other expertise let's focus on what we can do because this also has a lot of applications see when you talk about small chips or reducing the size of the chips that is required in electronic products phones and these kind of smart products but when you talk about ev electric vehicles etc railway electronics in these kind of systems even when the chip is slightly bigger that will also work so the first suggestion is the government of india should focus on segment that is over 180 nanometer rather than focusing on very very small chips that is not our expertise it may come with in future but right now that is not the case secondly government has to offer subsidies on these products see the entire idea is semiconductor chips or these kind of markets are so 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 capital intensive that for example you will not see any startup today that says i want to set up a semiconductor industry you will see starters working in other field why would you not see a startup say that i will in make a factory for semiconductor why because it takes such a huge amount of money it will take over 1 billion dollar in fact the suggestion is it might take close to 10 billion dollars to set up a factory now which startup has 10 billion dollars just to set up an industry no startup would want to invest that much money so when an industry is so capital intensive and it requires so much money it becomes a responsibility of the government to give a push in the beginning the government has to give subsidies so that these kind of industries are actually taken into consideration now this was the end of the article in this article if you read it yourself there's a very interesting phrase that is used two times in this article the phrase that is used here is more than more please remember understand this and listen to this very carefully there is a phrase used in this article the phrase is more than more it has been used two times in this article the author has not defined what is this but let me tell you what exactly does this phrase mean because this is important for all of us so basically moore or gordon moore was the founder of intel intel company that we are talking about its founder the name was gordon moore i am saying was because he died very recently so very recently founder of intel passed away now he gave a law 
and this law is called the Moore's law. Moore, as I said, is the second name, the last name of Intel's founder. There is a Moore's law. What is the Moore's law? He said that every two years, number of transistors on a microchip will double. Have you ever uh, opened up any electronic instrument? Have you opened up, let's say, an FM or let's say a mobile phone or a computer, laptop, anything? If you would have opened it up, you would have seen that there is this kind of a basically a motherboard there's a red or green color board that you will see on the top of that green colored board there would be a lot of very small instruments some transistors some capacitors etc they would be soldered on that board so basically what he said was every two years the number of transistors on that chip would double every two years this was his assumption this was called the moore's law meaning that he's said every two years the size of the transistors will reduce so much that you will be able to accommodate twice of what you used to do earlier also under the moore's law he said the speed and the capability of computers will rise every two years and we will the cost will keep on reducing this is what he said this is the graph about the moore's law means the size of the semiconductors, the chips will keep on reducing and the cost also will keep on reducing because the number of transistors that you can actually put on one chip will increase time and time again every two years. In simple ideas, this is the Moore's law named after the Intel founder. However, the article uses a phrase, as I told you, the phrase that it uses is more than Moore. Now, what do you mean by more than Moore? More than Moore is a phrase that is used in semiconductor industry. It simply means that semiconductor chips now have a lot other applications apart from just laptops and computers. More than Moore says that there are new and new technologies that now require these kind of semiconductor chips. What are these technologies? Technologies such as different types of devices, different types of circuits, photonics, etc. EV, electronic, electric vehicles that we talk about. All these new types of technology that are coming up, all these technologies also require semiconductor chip. This is called more than Moore because Gordon Moore, who was a founder of Intel, only envisaged that semiconductors will be useful for laptops, computers. More than Moore means now these chips are essential and are or have their application even beyond these kind of laptops computers they can be used in other fields as well this is what the author is saying that for laptops computers for those kind of small machines we require very advanced kind of chips so government of india should not focus on that let us focus on more than more so that our chip size even if it is bigger it can still have applications such as electric vehicles and other kind of devices that is the entire idea similarly before i jump on to second topic it is also important that we revise quickly about what is india's semiconductor mission as i said this is a mission that the government of india started after we went through the pandemic we realized that the semiconductor chain the global supply chain is not that dependable so in 2021 the government announced Indian Semiconductor Mission. The government gave it a budget of 76,000 crore rupees. It is under Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. The idea was simple. The government said we will give enough financial support to those companies who want to set up such kind of factories. So for example, the Vedanta Group, uh, the big Vedanta Group that you might know, this Vedanta Group is the one that is setting up such a huge factory. Apart from that, government said we will give financing help to semiconductor fabrication labs, display fabrication labs, etc. Then the government will also be helping with semiconductor assembly, testing, packaging. The government will also have a design linked incentive scheme. So whatever design or whatever designing companies that are coming in India for semiconductor management, for semiconductor making, the government of India will help them with this as well. This was a part of India's semiconductor mission. The idea was not just to make India self-sufficient in semiconductor chips, but India should also become an export destination for semiconductor chips because this is something that nations around the world right now require. 
and we are dependent on just a few handful of countries that control the entire global supply chain. So the objective is to have a long term strategy for manufacturing facilities and design ecosystem in the country to also have supply chain for raw material required for chemicals, manufacturing equipment, etc. Promote indigenous intellectual property, meaning that we can maybe in the beginning take help from companies such as Intel, etc. But over the years, we have to ensure that our own technology develops so that we are able to use our own homemade technology in the future. All these are the components of India's semiconductor mission that the government of India is trying to achieve. This brings us to the end of topic number one. Okay. Let me take up a few questions. Apurva is saying companies like Tata, why can't they set up semiconductor plants? <laughs> they can. Maybe call Ratan Tata and he will do this. See, one, how, what do you expect one single company to do what exactly? So basically, companies do invest in a lot of different fields. It's not that one single company will do everything else. Whatever they find the feasibility in, they would do that. I would uh, advise, please don't copy paste your comment time and time again. Typing your comment once is good enough. We can see it once. If you're just repeating it time and time again, uh, it, you are just hiding each other's comments. So please don't do that. This is not advisable. It would in fact mean that I will not take your comment if you just keep on copy pasting in time and time again. Uh, Rudraksha is saying, can you please repeat the Moore's law? Yes, yeah, so Moore's law basically is given by the founder of Intel. According to him, every two years, the number of transistors on a chip will keep on doubling and the cost of making these chips every two years will fall down. Nisha is saying, what is the work of this semiconductor? So Nisha, every single electronic instrument that we have, all of these work on the basis of these semiconductor chips. Semiconductor chips are basically the building blocks of almost every kind of technology that you use today. AC, TV, your car, your microwave, uh, your phone, all of these, the screen where you are watching me, all of that has certain semiconductor chips because of it they are able to work. Okay. Then, uh, let me quickly take up one or two more and then I'll go ahead. Okay. Yes, Meghna, you can attend the Target Pilims on Baidu's app. It is free for everyone. Okay. Perfect. Uh, one more question. Himanshi, thing, what is custom duty? Custom duty is basically when you uh, import something and you put tax on that. That is mainly customs duty. Okay. Perfect. Let's move on then. The next article that we have is based on Sri Lanka. As you know, the Sri Lankan government has been going through a very, very tough time. <clears throat> Sri Lanka's economy has been on a constant decline. And Sri Lanka's economy was in a decline even before the pandemic as well. From 2019, in fact, Sri Lanka's economy has had a problem. Now, the reason why this is in the news is that IMF has finally agreed to give a bailout package or a loan of about $3 billion to Sri Lanka. However, taking a loan from the IMF is not that easy. As you know, taking a loan from the IMF is a very, very difficult thing for any country. Please try and understand something. We will be discussing why is Sri Lanka going through such a crisis. Before that, let's try and understand when a country takes loan from IMF versus when a country takes loan from the World Bank. These are two very different things. Please understand. World Bank gives loan for development activities. If you have to build a road, you have to build a dam, any poverty elevation program, then World Bank will give the loan. Usually World Bank loans are given at a low rate of interest, so the countries can easily take that. IMF on the other hand is a different entity altogether. IMF for example, gives a loan if a country doesn't have foreign exchange reserves. If a country doesn't have foreign exchange reserves, then they will go to IMF because they don't have the money to buy anything from any other country. For example, Sri Lanka doesn't have money to buy oil from any other country. Sri Lanka doesn't have money to repay their loans. That is why countries will go to IMF. The other interesting difference is from the World Bank, it is essentially the poor countries that take loan from the World Bank. Poor countries, developing countries, they are the ones who take loan from the World Bank. From the IMF, on the other hand, even the rich countries can go when they have some trouble. The rich countries also there are some European countries that have gone to IMF. Greece, for example, has gone to IMF. So IMF is not just only for the poor countries. 
the big difference between the two is when IMF gives a loan to any country, they put conditionalities. There's a term called conditionalities. Now, what do you mean by conditionalities? As the name suggests, the idea is when the IMF will give a loan, it will put a lot of conditions on the country. Only then it will give the loan. What are the conditions? Conditions such as IMF will tell the government, you cannot give subsidies. You have to increase your taxing taxes. You have to take more money from the people. Increase your rate of petrol, etc. Basically, what IMF does is they ensure that the government starts earning more money. The government becomes more disciplined and anything free given to the people has to be cut down. This is what conditionalities are for the IMF. Now, this is why most countries prefer not to go to the IMF until the situation is very bad. Usually countries go to the IMF if there is no other option remaining. That is how the IMF usually works. Because IMF will put a lot of these conditions which the nations don't like because they don't want to put these conditions. No government would like to tell its citizens we are increasing taxes on you because they will not get the votes then. No government would like to tell the citizens we are increasing the rate of petrol because they will not get the votes. So going to IMF is difficult but since there is no other option, Sri Lanka has gone to IMF once again. This is their 17th time of going to IMF. 17th. India on the other hand, if you want to compare, India has not gone to the IMF since 1991. The 1991 crisis that we have had, the economic crisis, that was a time when we went to IMF. Even then when we went to IMF in 1991, the amount of money IMF had given to us, sanctioned to us, India did not take the complete amount because our situation started to improve very quickly. After 1991, India has not gone to the IMF, but countries such as Sri Lanka, Pakistan, they go to IMF very, very frequently. This is Sri Lanka's 17th time to the IMF. IMF has agreed to a loan of $3 billion to be given over four years on several conditions, as I told you. Conditions are to decrease corruption, to cut down on the subsidy, etc. Also, there will be an international team from IMF. This is important. There will be an international team from the IMF that will investigate whether corruption has gone down in Sri Lanka or not. Now, this is very extreme. Please understand, no country, no government would like any international team, any international organization to come and investigate their government. Because it is against the government's prestige. How can a government say, oh, someone else will come in and they will investigate us? The countries only accept these conditions when they have no other options remaining. And that is the case with Sri Lanka. Since they have no other option remaining, they, are, they have agreed to IMF even taking up anti-corruption surveys in India, which IMF will conduct. Only then the loan will be given. Now, Sri Lankan economy, as you know, is in a bad, bad, bad shape. Inflation in the last year was above 90%, so almost everything almost doubled in prices in Sri Lanka. Economy contracted by about 8%. And then there were some very bad decisions taken. I don't want to use the word stupid because let's not do that, but very bad decisions were taken. For example, Sri Lanka recently completed 75 years of its independence. So Sri Lanka got independence one year after India. Sri Lanka's independence was in 1948 from the British. We were in, in 1947, Sri Lanka in 1948. So in 2023 only, they completed 75 years anniversary. They spent a lot of money in the 75 year anniversary celebration. And everyone was surprised, how did they get so much money? On one hand, they are saying, oh, I don't have money, I don't have money. On the other hand, the government is spending so much money on lavish celebrations. And the other interesting part is just after that, just a few days after this lavish celebration, Sri Lanka had to conduct their local polls, like our local municipality polls. Sri Lanka had to conduct local body polls and the government cancelled that. Why? So they said we have no money to conduct elections. So now let's try and understand. On one hand, the government is spending crores of rupees on celebrating 75th years of independence. And few days later, they are saying we don't have money to conduct elections. So the elections were cancelled. This is what Sri Lanka has been going through. That is why when you do such things, obviously IMF etc. will think twice before giving you the loan. What if you take the loan to buy food and rather than that you keep on spending money in celebrations. 
that is why the problem start world bank has estimated that poverty has doubled in shila or has doubled to 25% in sri lanka just last year so sri lanka is going through a very 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 bad time now the problem is as i said when you take a loan from the imf you have to fulfill the conditions conditions are increase taxes on people for example take more money from the people this is why trade unions in sri lanka are also protesting trade unions are saying no we will not give more tax because see this is a very bad situation people anyways are going through a tough time they don't have job they don't have food to eat on top of that the government says now you have to pay more taxes just imagine from the common person's point of view in sri lanka do you know a few months back there was such a shortage of petrol and diesel in sri lanka that there was a quota imposed on everyone that one person can only buy this much oil and not more than that on petrol pump there were qr codes you had to scan the qr code to tell who you are your identity aadhar kind of a thing and based on that you can only get some minimum number or maximum amount of petrol not more than that so they are going through such a bad time and on top of that because of imf condition they have to increase taxes also on the people only then the situation will improve so this is why we have a lot of issues in sri lanka going on now why is it that it concerns india understand this when your neighbor goes through a tough time that becomes a problem for any country the reason why we have a problem with sri lanka going through a tough time is that when they are going through such times it makes it easy for china to have influence over sri lanka china will now come oh brother you don't have money oh don't worry i am here i'll i'll give you whatever money that you want why are you worrying i will give you whatever you want in return just give me your port give me your land and i will use it against india this is why the problem now starts the problem is that india doesn't want our neighboring countries to come under influence of china they become much more vulnerable when they are in such a scenario and this is why india is worried now why is that in sri lanka has fallen into such a huge economic crisis there are a lot of reasons of this economic crisis of sri lanka some are man made so some are because of the bad decisions taken by the sri lankan government while some were uncontrollable so there are two types of reasons some that they could not control and some that they did themselves let's try and understand this see even before the pandemic sri lanka's situation was not that great to be true sri lanka after the civil war had ended they had a financial crisis so in 2009 they took a loan from the imf but after that situation started to improve now what has happened is sri lanka understand from sri lanka's point of view how do they earn money sri lanka's money mainly comes from two things please understand first tourism tourism is a big earner for sri lanka's economy and second is exports such as tea there is tea there is rubber etc so basically agriculture export and tourism are the two things from which sri lanka mainly earns money now let's understand what has happened there are a lot of reasons why sri lanka is going through such a crisis i'll tell you some reasons first in 2019 there was a easter bomb blast in april so on the day of easter celebrations when a lot of people assembled in the churches there were multiple bomb blasts in churches on the day of the easter that is called the easter bombings later on islamic state took the responsibility now what happens is when a tourist has to come to a country and the tourist read this news that oh there are bomb blasts in the country this is not a safe country and obviously the tourist will not go to that country as simple as that so it all started with that easter bomb blast where the tourism started to decline slightly then we had the government promising lower taxes because when the government see in any democracy when the governments come to power what do they say bring me to power you will not have to pay any taxes this will be free that will be free whatever you touch will be free don't worry you just bring me power and i will give you everything for free right it happens with every democracy it's not just with india look at pakistan imran khan came to power he reduced the price of petrol and now what is hap- happening in pakistan sri lanka rajapaksha brothers when they came to power they reduced prices of everything because they wanted vote as simple as that doesn't matter the government is going into losses 
politicians think, oh, the next government will listen to it. Next government will handle it. How do I care? So in 2019, taxes were reduced and then came the pandemic. While first two, you can say were kind of government's responsibility. Easter bombing attacks, maybe government could have stopped it. At least the second point was government's decision, so they had to take the blame. But then COVID-19, when this started, it was no one's to blame. COVID-19 especially hit those countries the hardest, which are dependent on tourism. Sri Lanka, Mauritius, Maldives, Seychelles, those countries, which are mainly dependent on tourism only, they were hit the hardest. So in Sri Lanka, tourism almost stopped, the earnings stopped. Then came the decision of the millennium where the Sri Lankan government decided to switch to organic farming. Now, Sri Lankan government, see every politician, it's not just about India and every country, every politician has this dream that I want to be known around the world, not just in my country. Because every politician thinks, how can I become an immortal figure so that everyone remembers me even after I'm gone. So Sri Lanka thought, oh, let me do something that people will remember me long after I am gone. So what did they do? They announced overnight that from tomorrow, Sri Lanka is going 100% organic. This was a random announcement that Sri Lanka is going 100% organic from tomorrow. Now, why was this done? So that at the international stage, we can say, see, we are such a great country. We are going towards natural farming. We care so much about the environment. But what they did not care was about their farmers. If you go organic overnight, do you expect your farmers from tomorrow onwards to stop using fertilizer all of a sudden, to stop using urea, to stop use every single thing and only buy natural fertilizers? They were natural fertilizers were not even available in the market. And all of a sudden, whatever agriculture Sri Lanka had, all of that got destroyed. They were not able to produce stuff for their own rather than exporting. Exporting is a different matter altogether. There was a food shortage in the country. All of this pushed Sri Lanka towards even a bigger crisis. On top of that, there was one very interesting incident that happened. So what happened was Sri Lanka went through this era when they said no organic farming, only natural fertilizers. So they had to import natural fertilizers. So where do they go? Obviously China. So China said, oh, don't worry, bro, I will give you organic fertilizer. I have a lot of it. So China imported or they sent two huge ships of organic fertilizers. Now, one, when these ships came to Sri Lanka, China, uh, Sri Lanka said, let us first test a sample of these fertilizers to check it doesn't have any chemicals because the idea is 100% organic farming. So they checked it. And when they checked those fertilizers, the two ships full of, full of fertilizer, when they checked it had chemicals. So Sri Lanka said, oh, I don't, I can't take it. You have to take it back. So China says, oh, bro, once sold, we don't take anything back. It has been sold. The ship is yours. Now you have to pay the money. We don't care how you use it, how you don't use it. So all these things, one after the other, just actually made the situation in Sri Lanka even worse. Then they came to India. India started helping them. Our uh, organi uh, IFCO, for example, sent a lot of organic fertilizer. We sent nano urea also to Sri Lanka. So all these kind of issues, again, they are more about their own decisions. Again, I don't want to say stupid, but I'm saying stupid time and time again. I realize that. But I don't want to say stupid decision, but bad decision on Sri Lankan government's part. So some decisions where they had no control, like COVID-19, but some decisions where they could have done better, but they did not do that. And whenever there is a crisis, the one country that takes the opportunity with both hands is China. When China knows that yes, Sri Lanka doesn't have money, we will give them money. Chinese money is always at a much higher rate of interest than the market. Please understand, usually when the countries give loan to any other country, they give loans so that they can improve relationship with the other country. For China, when they give the loan, it is purely for the purpose of business. When China gives loan, it is purely for earning interest on that. So their interest rates are higher than the market. Chinese loans are very, very bad. And all of that means Sri Lanka's issue with the economic crisis is still going on. Let's hope that situation becomes better after this $3 billion loan that the IMF has granted. This was the second important article.
Kiraya has a good question. IMF gives free loans, interest free. No, no, IMF loans are not interest free. They are pretty good. They are, have a significant interest. They put restrictions because they know country has no other option if they are coming to IMF. That is why. So IMF puts restrictions. If you don't like it, don't take loan from the IMF. As simple as that. Abhijit is saying from the lens of India, how do we use China's influence on Sri Lanka? From India lens, it's obviously bad. We would not want one of our neighbors to have Chinese influence. It already has a lot of Chinese influence. Hamban Tota port is under China's control for 99 years. In Pakistan also. The only option is we cater to Sri Lanka, whatever they require, we should give them before, Sri, before China. So we are trying to bring them back under our influence, but we do have certain limitations. We can't give so much money as China can give. So it's not really that easy. I have given this example earlier as well. And I'll give this example once again. If you as an individual have two relatives, there is one relative that comes to your house, does not speak to you, does not behave well with you, but before going away gives you 2000 rupees every single time. And then there's one relative that comes to your house, speaks with you very well, plays with you, helps you with the homework, but doesn't give you any money while going back. Which relative would you want? should visit your place time and time again. You will obviously want the first relative. That is what China is. Second relative is India. So that is the difference between the two. India cannot match China with money. But we try to match with our soft power. Concessional loans means loans at a low rate of interest. Okay. Um, Chinese loans are not interest free. Please understand Chinese loans are, pretty, are at pretty high rate of interest. Then... Uh, <clears throat> I have a question. Ayush, for understanding Pilim's question from this topic, attend the quiz on the Telegram channel after this. There you will see the quiz on or questions on Pilim's from these topics. I'll take one or two more and then we'll go ahead. Um, Himanshi saying, why Sri Lanka borrows from China only? Because, see, when you have such a project which is not feasible, no country will give you the loan. Only China will give you the loan. They came to India, also followed India, denied because we knew that that is not a good project. China will give loan for any project. Uh, okay, I'll take one last question and then we'll go ahead. Yes, voting is still an issue in the IMF. USA controls almost everything in the IMF. Sabai saying, what should be used in the answer instead of stupid or bad? Bad is a good word. Use bad decisions. Don't use stupid decisions. Use bad decisions. Not really a problem. Okay, let's go ahead then. The next article that we have here from the front page of the Hindu newspaper is the government of India has released a new policy that is the new foreign trade policy. Now India already had a foreign trade policy from 2015. We have renewed it. Now a new policy has come in 2023 policy. As I said, whenever these kind of policies are released by the government, they are extremely important for you. In the mains examination, the, government, the UPSC can ask about the important provisions of such policies. Basically, the new foreign trade policy has some important pointers, which I would like all of you to remember. The new foreign trade policy mainly is focusing on swifter clearances, means the permissions required for import-export will be given at a much faster pace. The government will also give one-time amnesty scheme for explore, export obligation default. What does it mean? Till now, the government had a lot of rules that if someone in ex is exporting some commodity from India, they have to fulfill certain obligations. They have to take certain permissions, etc. The government is saying till now, if there was an exporter who did not take such permissions but was still exporting, government is giving him one time amnesty. Means government is saying one time we will not give any punishment to you. We are forgetting, forgiving whatever you did so far. But now please take permissions, whatever are required. So government is focusing on one time amnesty scheme as well. The idea is government wants to triple India's export by 2030. The aim of the government is to reach $2 trillion of export by 2030. That is the headline of this policy. $2 trillion export by 2030. There are no major schemes that are introduced. The government has just revised some of the earlier targets. As I said, tripling of exports by 2030. Also, getting taking feedback from the community of exporters, helping different types of initiatives, etc. Let me give you a small 
gist of what are the highlights of the policy. First, new growth areas. So government is focusing a lot on new growth areas such as, let me give you a simple example. Government of India is saying that for example, there is a commodity that is banned in India from exporting. Let's try and understand this. Let's say there is a commodity X which cannot be imported to India. The government is saying that from now onwards what can happen is an Indian company can take order for this commodity let's say from Sri Lanka. We cannot supply it from to Sri Lanka. So what Indian company can do is Indian company can buy it from US and directly sell it to Sri Lanka without importing to India. That is what the government of India is focusing on. This is called merchanting trade. Merchanting trade means you be the merchant in between rather than importing something within the country if it is banned don't import it just take it from one country and give it to the other country that is also now being allowed by the government of India for export of restricted goods. The government as I said is offering one time amnesty so all those exporters who have not fulfilled certain obligations from the government all those exporters who broke certain laws in the past government is saying for one time we are forgiving everything that you did but from now onwards again start afresh now take all the permissions so this is called one year amnesty we will give this permission to you then the government of India is also focusing on clothing and apparel sector mainly to ensure that clothing fashion export becomes even better this is in line with the PM Mitra scheme that we have discussed earlier. Under PM Mitra scheme, the government is setting up textile parks. So we want to give a push to textile export as well. The government will also now give star rating to exporters as well. So those exporters who are exporting from India, government will give star ratings so that the buyers can now see from which exporter do they want to take stuff or not. Four cities in Uttar Pradesh have been identified like Faridabad, uh, Muradabad, Mirzapur, Varanasi etc. They have been identified as a centers of excellence in the field of handicraft, carpets, handlooms etc. This is again in line with the government's PM Mitra scheme. Now I will also give you a summarized version of this entire foreign trade policy. Please make sure that you go through this you, when you download the PPT from the link given in the PPT you will get the summarized version. So I have given you about 14-15 pointers. Please remember these pointers. These are the main pointers of the foreign trade policy. Yes, I also think I also think this is an error in the Hindu newspaper. Faridabad is in Haryana. Faizabad is in uh, UP. So this seems to be an error in the Hindu newspaper. So we'll have to check that. But this is taken from the Hindu newspaper. Let's report them back. It would be either Faizabad or Faridabad would be in Haryana. Anyway, so as you can see here, these are the summarized pointers. Please do read these from the downloaded PPT. These are all self-explanatory. Reduction of duties, taxes from export. Government will give remissions, etc. Government will provide a policy framework. Government will make sure that all the permissions, etc. are taken online. Then government will give star ratings, etc. The government will promote trading in Indian rupees only. Merchanting trade that we discussed. All these are important pointers of the foreign trade policy. Again, the policy itself is very long, very detailed. I am just giving it to you. I am just giving a very summarized version, a small summarized version of all of this. Those who are asking about the PPT uh, in the description of the video, you will find the link to download this as a PDF and you can get that for your revision purposes. This is also again summarized version of all the things that the foreign trade policy has. Since the policy was released just yesterday, in the coming days you might see more analysis about this. But right now, these are the important pointers from this particular policy. So please do read this in detail as well. This is the aim of the government, financial year 2030. Government wants to reach $2 trillion of export. Right now, where do we stand? Right now, Indian exports are about $760 billion and it has been growing from the past few years. These are the main areas of our export. 
in electronics especially we have seen a good growth toys again as an industry where we have seen a good growth you would have noticed how prime minister of india is also focusing on the toy industry specifically the government of india realizes the significance and the potential that we have in exporting toys so all these are important data that you must remember these are the important pointers or these are the important topics from the mains point of view now let's go ahead and see what are some of the important news stories from the prelims point of view in the hindu newspaper today one interesting news that came in is that the government of india is now contemplating putting the cert in organization in the exempted list of the rti now as you know rti right to information under the right to information act you have the option to ask for information from public authorities so you can ask questions to government authorities to government ministries departments etc the questions will be answered as per the law within 30 days and then there are certain other pointers if it's a matter of someone's life or personal liberty it will be answered within 48 hours etc but the main pointer is there are certain organizations under the government which are exempted from the RTI there are certain organizations which can refuse to take RTI because these organizations work for national security purposes the government of india is thinking cert in also should be made a part of this list cert in also should not be forced to give out information now what is cert in exactly what does it do basically cert in is the government department that is responsible for handling any cyber security threat towards the government whenever you see you see a news that there is a hacking attempt by the chinese some foreign country or some foreign hackers are attempting to hack indian website government servers are being harmed it is cert in responsibility they are the ones who have to ensure that the response is given cert in works under ministry of electronics and information technology they will also be given exemption just like organization such as cbi bsf has been given now cert in recently last year in fact gave an order to companies which run vpn virtual private network etc and cryptocurrencies also to preserve the user request so cert in wanted cryptocurrency platforms etc also to do the kyc keep a record of their customers so that they can share with cert in all these records if they are requested now as i said cert in is extremely important for the working of the government what do they do they are the national nodal agency for any computer security threat incidents this was established in 2004 and works under ministry of information electronics and information technology cert in has been responsible for countering all the threats for example a few months back you would have seen there was a hacking attempt on the server of the aims remember we all read that news those aims server attacks those kind of attacks when they take place in india the responsibility of the organization to fight against these hack these attempts is the cert in they are the ones who coordinate with all the government department they give guidelines how to maintain your computer how to maintain your systems how to Uh, have hacking attempts being uh, uh, how to basically neutralize these hacking attempts not just this now the rule is even if a private organization in india faces a hacking attempt they also have to report the incident to cert in so cert in earlier used to only take up information or handle attacks from the government now even private organizations when they face certain attacks they have to report it to cert in so that they can keep a track who is trying to harm into india these are the things that they do collect information about cyber incidents issue alerts take emergency measures issue guidelines etc all about cyber security is done by cert in i also wanted to give you this list of exempted organizations under the rti as i said the rti has a lot of these organizations that are not forced to share data for example ib intelligence bureau raw cbi etc bsf crpf the government is trying to include cert in also in this list only so cert is is not the only organization that will come into this picture this all these organizations still are exempted from the rti that is how it usually works the next article that we have is a statement by an australian minister for trade and tourism 
the Australian Minister of Trade and Tourism has said that we want to export lithium to other countries as well with reference to India. Basically, the article is in context of question being asked that why does Australia only export lithium mainly to US? Australia has said that we would not want to export lithium to US and China only. These are the two countries to which they export mostly. They would want to ensure that they export lithium to other countries as well, including India. Now, lithium is a very, very important topic for the UPSC. As you know, lithium deposits have been found in Jammu and Kashmir as well. Lithium right now is a very, very critical metal. Importantly, in the news for lithium ion batteries which are considered as a lifeline of electric vehicles most of the world's lithium ion batteries right now I, it, there's a kind of monopoly that china has maintained over 70 percent of lithium ion batteries right now around the world are being produced by china they are the ones who export it to all the countries around the world so that is a problem china still has a monopoly over it now in terms of other countries, the question that was asked to Australian minister was with reference to USA. Why are you only importing or exporting these lithium ion, lithium, etc. to US only? There is one more thing that you have to understand. We did discuss it a few months back. USA recently passed a law called IRA, Inflation Reduction Act. Have you read this? Do you remember this or not? We did discuss in one of the earlier CNAs. Inflation Reduction Act. Anyone who remembers this? This was passed last year, 2022. Perfect. So those who remember, great. Those who don't know, let me quickly remind you. America recently passed a bill or passed a law called Inflation Reduction Act. The simple idea was that they will give a push to those industries, those factories working in the field of climate change. So it talked about a lot of subsidies being given from the government to these companies on certain conditions. So all these companies which are making, let's say, solar panels, which are making electric cars, they will be given a lot of subsidy from the American government. That was an Inflation Reduction Act. Under this, close to $350 billion will be spent by the government of US, mainly to give encouragement to those industries working in the field of renewable energy. Now, a lot of countries, which are friends of US in fact, have spoken against the Inflation Reduction Act. India also has criticized the Inflation Reduction Act. Many countries don't like it. Why? See, the idea is, as per the law, for example, it says, only those American companies will be given subsidy from the government if, for example, at least 40% of the critical minerals such as lithium is bought from the US or from those countries which have a free trade agreement with the US. Let me repeat and please listen to this very carefully. If any company in the US wants to get subsidy from their government, only those companies will get subsidy which are using at least 40% of critical minerals which are bought either from US only or they have bought it from free trade partners of the US such as Australia etc. This is why other countries are not happy. Europe, South Korea, they are saying now it means that our companies will not be selling products to USA. India also is not happy because this is being seen as a protectionist policy. Protectionist policy means when a government says that I will only promote products made in my country not exported from other countries. So Inflation Reduction Act has been criticized by a lot of American partners. Europe also, France, etc. for example, has spoken up against America's act because they are saying American government is forcing their companies to buy product from only a few countries which are the free trade partners of America. That is the entire issue. Australia right now is saying that we are open to supplying lithium to other countries as well. But India obviously does not like that Australia is only exporting this lithium to America. Now, it is also important for us to understand lithium reserves around the world because lithium again has been a lot in the news. 
Now lithium is found in Australia also. Yes, they are exporting in a large number, but usually the biggest lithium deposits around the world are actually in South America. This is called as a lithium triangle. This is the lithium triangle. Please do remember lithium triangle basically is made of three countries. That is Chile, Bolivia and Argentina. Chile, Bolivia, Argentina, these are the three countries that have a lot of lithium reserves. It is said that Bolivia has the largest number of lithium reserves. Then there's Argentina, US also has it, then Chile, then other countries. India's lithium reserves which have been found in Jammu Kashmir. Once they go to the final confirmation stage, India will also have a lot of lithium reserves, about 5.9% of the entire world. But again, understand this, just because a country has the highest amount of reserves, that doesn't mean they will be the largest exporter as well. Having reserves is one thing, mining the lithium, then being able to export it is a different matter altogether. I'll give you an example. Do you know right now, and please don't Google it, do you know which country in the world has the largest proven oil reserves right now? Any idea? Which country has the largest proven oil reserves in the world? What do you think? And don't Google it, please. The more time that you take in answering, the more I think you are Googling it. <laughs> A few people have given correct answer. Most people have given incorrect answers. The surprising part is it is not from the Middle East. It is not from the Middle East. Let me give this as a homework to you. After the class, do tell me in the comment section, which is the country with the largest proven oil reserves in the world. And the interesting part is that they are not the largest exporters. They are not the largest exporters. They have the largest proven oil reserves, but they don't export a lot because of their own problems. So with lithium also, just because a country might have the largest reserves, that does not really mean that all the reserves or those countries are the ones that will be exporting the most. Please do search it and tell me in the comment section after the video. And when you are searching it, search for one more thing. Okay, when you are searching about lithium, search or searching about oil, search about one more thing. The other thing that I want you to search is, there is one country, listen to this carefully, there is one country that has over three-fourth reserves of cobalt in the entire world. There is one country that has almost complete monopoly over cobalt reserves. One country that has complete monopoly. Which is that one country? Find that out as well and tell me in the comment section later on. Not right now. After the video ends, tell me largest oil reserves and the country which has almost monopoly over cobalt reserves. This lithium, cobalt, these are the things that remain in the news, so do read about it. Now you can stop writing in the chat, you can write later on in the comment section. Let's go ahead then. Now lithium ion batteries have a lot of different applications. They are mainly being used right now in electric vehicles. All the electric vehicles around the world that you see in India or in US, Tesla, etc. All of them somewhere down the line use the lithium ion batteries. Lithium ion batteries are extremely important for all these renewable energy applications and that is why countries around the world right now are in a lot of demand of lithium. There are a lot of very interesting cases around the world about these critical elements. There are many countries around the world which are now just focusing on finding more minerals and exporting. I'll suggest you one more thing. If you have some time later on, on Sunday or whenever you have some time, read a bit about Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is going through a very interesting time right now. Zimbabwe has all of a sudden found out a lot of interesting mineral reserves in their country. USA usually did not have good relationship with Zimbabwe. They thought Zimbabwe is not a good democracy. We will not talk to them. But now USA has identified there are so many mineral reserves in Zimbabwe that they also want to make friends with Zimbabwe. Then China is again trying to come close to Zimbabwe. Usually in India, we only remember Zimbabwe as a cricket playing nation that we will play matches with them and we will defeat them. But the reality is Zimbabwe has actually identified a lot of very, very wealthy mineral reserves and they are trying to turn around their economy because of that. So do read about that when you get some time. Anyway, let's go to the last topic for the day. UK has decided to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The Trans-Pacific Partnership that was earlier called TPP. Now the full name is 
comprehensive and progressive agreement on the trans pacific partnership this was a partnership where america also was a member initially but then donald trump came in he said no we will not be a partner here or america withdrew itself however uk now wants to join it this is a group which has 11 members right now and they account for about 13 percent of the global gdp the uk is saying that once we become a member almost 99 percent of our exports will be duty free they will be able to export cheese cars chocolates whiskey etc without any tariff so it will be helpful for them these kind of groups are important please do remember their members as well uk is also in talks with a with india for a free trade deal although we have not signed it so far the other interesting part is if uk becomes a member first it will be difficult for china to become a member why see these kind of groups whenever a new member has to join a new member will only join if all the existing members say yes so if uk joins it china also has requested to join but if uk joins it first they can veto china from joining it so that is why it is extremely important for uk to join it first uk will be joining it officially in the coming few months all the negotiations are now over this is a comprehensive and progressive agreement for trans pacific partnership as you can see there are 11 members so far america also had said that we would become a member then they went away after that these are a few details about the trans pacific partnership that you must remember so it has 11 members canada mexico peru chile new zealand australia brunei singapore malaysia vietnam and japan again if there is a article that tells you america is a member that means it's an old article america is not a member now Donald Trump removed America as a member of TPP. USA withdrew it, as I said. Now UK wants to become a part. The aim is to remove 99% of tariffs on these goods and services. It will cover a lot of things, telecommunication, financial services, food standards, etc. The countries will also focus not just on trade, but also on curtailing wildlife trafficking, help wildlife species, etc. This is what is the idea behind the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And this brings us to the end of the session. There are a couple of practice questions for you. There are a couple of words missing. Throw light. So please don't throw the question. Throw some light on this question. So the question is, throw light on the significant features of India's new foreign trade policy. How is India's new foreign trade policy different as compared to the earlier policy? Then the second question is about India's semiconductor mission. Both these are very, very relevant questions for all of you to answer, try and answer these. These are the kind of questions that you get in the mains examination. You have a couple of answers to give me in the comment section as well. So don't forget to join there as well. Thank you so much for watching in. Have a good day ahead. Have a good weekend ahead. Do enjoy the weekend, but don't forget to attend the other Hindu analysis as well every single day. Now go over to Telegram channel and attend that quiz. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good day ahead. Bye-bye. Jai